Hi everyone. This time the online guest is not a musician, not a rock star or anything like that, but it's someone who's served the metal for years and years and years. I can't even tell how many, but we're talking decades. And this guy, his name is Dan Tobin, is probably best known for his work as a label manager at Earache Records. And it's my deep pleasure to be able to say hi Dan and welcome to Band Bond. <laughs> it's a great okay. honor to have such a music metal industry legend with us as an online guest. Yeah, I think you mean the other guy that's coming after me. That's uh, <laughs> it's I, I actually you. Right <laughs> yeah, okay, very kind of you to say so. Thank you. <laughs> um, everybody's got their own story, you know, how they got into hard rock and metal. Just for starters, how did it? Uh, how did you become a metalhead? Into the music? Well, I guess like everybody, you uh, through the radio. If you're a certain age, you found stuff through the radio. So there used to be um, a chart radio countdown every weekend i guess every sunday and they would play every song on the chart and sometimes there would be like a heavier band on but i used to tape the chart so you would try and tape each song off the radio and then you would edit that down into your own compilation tape and uh so i was taping everything pop it didn't matter to me at, when you're like 11 years old or whatever but the songs that stood out for me most i remember most in must have been in the very early 80s, 80, 83, 84, were bands like ACDC, Status Quo, um, Finn Lizzy, Iron Maiden, you know, those types of things. So that's where it started, I think. Um, and then a little bit later, when I got to like high school, there was a kid there in the year above me. I was already buying records and stuff, but um, there was a kid in the year above me that kind of knew a bit more than I did. And um he kind of led me on the right path of like, you don't want that crappy band. You want this. And, you know, so I remember going to school all the time with like uh, that first, like I had a Walkman real early on a cassette Walkman. How lovely. And uh, I remember very much on one side, there was uh, the first Anthrax album. And on the other side, it must, it was an Aussie album. I'm wanting to say it was something like Bark at the Moon or whatever, but, and that, that's all I really had. So I just like played that all the time on the way to school on the way back. And then of course, when you meet other people, it broadens out, but it was the radio. The radio started it for me. Uh, you remember the first album you bought? Hard rock slash metal album? I do. Rem I don't. Rem <laughs> Probably like status quo. I was really, really into status quo as, as a kid, really. And um, I did my school project, which I still have a copy of. We had to make like a magazine or whatever. And the project was on status quo. I made a status quo magazine. That's how crazy I was about them. I actually showed it to their management years later. They were like amazed that some kid had done this. How come you got into the music business? Because you didn't start out at uh, Earache. You started at um, Peaceville, right? Yeah. Well, I went to, I mean, I was in, I lived in London, you know, so I was very fortunate. I could go to shows every night. We had the Marquee Club there and, you know, I was seeing everybody there. But I didn't, my friends weren't really into it. So I would often go on my own to these shows. It didn't bother me. But um, And then you meet people at the shows, you see the same faces and it becomes a thing. But um, so when I, I went to university, but I was going to these shows all the time. When I left, I knew that I wanted to do something in music, but I had no idea what to do. And I literally just applied for every job that I could find. There's a music paper here called Music Week, which advertises jobs at the back. And uh, I applied every single job, didn't get anything. I ended up applying for a receptionist job. I couldn't type. I could barely answer the phone. You know, I didn't look like a receptionist. Uh, but somehow that guy there uh, at a company called Revolver, he gave me a job there. And that was killer because I didn't know it at the time. I was just answering the phone. But Revolver was a distributor for many great labels, including Peaceville and Eric. And so guys from those labels would come down for meetings at the office and I'd be in the reception area and say hello to them. And we get to know each other a little bit. Uh, they would give me cool promo stuff and whatever because they knew I was the only metal guy there or whatever. And the truth, the true story is, is that when Hammy from Peaceville came um, for a meeting, he phoned from the train station 
which was about five minutes away. And he said, I don't know how to get to the office. So how can I get to your office? And I said, well, stay there. I'll come and meet you and I'll bring you to the office. So it, by the time I had spent five minutes walking with him, I just told him, you know, I love everything on the label, Paradise Lost, Autopsy, you know, all of that. Um, and he said, oh, do you want to be a press officer? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, cool. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I didn't have a clue. <laughs> so we kept in contact. He invited me up to Yorkshire where they were based, went up there, met everybody. And then he said, right, you want to do it? I'm like, yeah. So I moved up there and I had no idea what a press officer did. Literally, I didn't know. Um, but that's how I got into it. And um, he asked me very early on to book a press trip for Thomas from At The Gates. This must have been on terminal spirit disease, I guess, or something. And I didn't know what a press trip was. It was so embarrassing. And I, I went home that night and I was like, oh, he wants me to send it to <laughs> Germany and Holland and the UK. Like, how do I do this? I had the map out in front of me of Europe looking at it. Going like, and I phoned my girlfriend and I said, look, I, I'm so embarrassed. I don't, know, I don't know what to do. She said, you go, I have to go in there tomorrow and tell him that you don't know. So I went in and I'm like, Hammy, I'm really sorry, but that thing you asked me to do, I don't know what you mean. What, what do you mean? So he explained what a press trip was. Ah, right. And he goes, yeah, we have like distributors. They'll book the flights for you. They'll organize it. I thought I had to organize everything, you know, from his front door to going home again. So it was a real learning curve because I was just a green as grass idiot. You know, I didn't know anything. Um, and through that, when Hammy sold his company to Music for Nations, I contacted the guys at Earache. And lucky their press guy was leaving. I was a press guy by that stage. At least I thought I knew what it was this, <laughs> by now. And um, yeah, and I got the job there and that's where I stayed. Fantastic. Uh, mm. I spoke to Anders Spioler, former uh, At The Gates member, oh, earlier Anders. today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, And and he said that it might have been you who, who poked Bib Bigby, uh, the founder oh, of Eric, yeah. about uh, At The Gates to sign yeah, them absolutely. for Slaughter of the Soul. Is that true? It is true. Dick didn't really know who they were. I mean, I'm sure he knew who they were, but he wasn't, you know, he had entombed. He didn't need another Swedish death metal band. But um, I got to know the guys quite well through terminal spirit disease. We kept in touch when I moved to Earache. They had that terrible UK tour with Sale, where if I get the story right, the tour manager ran off with the money or something and they had to go home. That's why they signed the deal. I guess everybody knows this now. They signed a deal with Blackmark. Uh, if they didn't pay Blackmark back, they were going to have to put the record out through them. And they didn't want to do that. I don't know why, but. Um, and so they started talking to me about this record they had and how they didn't want to do it through Blackmark. So I just kind of hassled Dig a little bit. And uh, I think he knew who they were, but he wasn't, you know, he didn't know much about them. But I had worked with them before. I was new at the company and he um, was good enough to trust me. And he said, yeah, do it. We didn't know, of course, that it was going to be slaughter of the soul but they did send me a couple of demos quite early on and i was thinking wow you know this is really the perfection of it didn't have the production but it had the songwriting that we were looking for melodic but aggressive which became the thing for a while but uh um and so when we put it out it was fantastic but it wasn't like a big success straight away it was um i think they went on a tour we did a european tour with unleashed they went to America for the first time. That was a big deal. I think they took dissection with them. Um, uh, was that your first signing? Yeah. Yeah. How lucky is that? Yeah, and, <laughs> it's and fantastic. That yeah. So after that, he kind of, he, you know, I was kind of trusted to sign a few more bands. Not everything worked, but um, and Dick was going off at a little different tangent with his musical taste at the time. So I would generally bring in the heavier bands and the weirder bands. Like I signed uh, like Mortis, I signed Mortis, uh, Cult of Luna from Sweden, Decapitated from Poland, Hate Eternal from the US. Um, and then moving into the modern era, you know, when we started doing these kind of more commercial blues rock bands, I was signing, I signed a band called The Temperance Movement. Um, and um you know i really enjoyed that period of time as well because we had a lot of success with those bands um there's a famous story dig likes to tell which is that he had got the nirvana album bleach and he liked it and like most of us did on the underground scene at the time and he made an offer to sub pop i have to get this right but i think he faxed an offer 
to Sub Pop for the next, the license on the next Nirvana record, not Bleach. So never mind. And he offered him like, you know, $1,000 or whatever for the license and uh, never got a reply or anything like that. But um, imagine if he had been able to pick up the license for that for $1,000. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you've seen many changes as a label manager throughout the years. You know, the first one, I think, was the Napster thing, you know, with downloading and all these other, you know, eras within the music yeah. business. When did you have the most fun yourself <laughs> working as a label manager and on a record label? Oh, I had fun all the time, honestly. I mean, it's not, I mean, even though I don't do it anymore. Um, just working in music is fantastic. I mean, you know, getting up every day, it's not a real job, is it? You know, you just get up and, uh, you know, whatever comes through the door you get on with, and you can be very creative if you want. To. It's all it's all down to yourself. That's the thing. It's whether you can come up with a cool idea or be hardworking enough to make something happen. And that's what I always loved. Just like black metal was impossible to become big, just like death metal was impossible to become big, it can become big if you if you stick at it. So... Um, so my favorite era was all of it, to be honest. Um, and, um, right up until the very end, you know, I was enjoying it very much with all the new bands and, uh, and making something different happen. How come you left that? Why did I leave? Yeah. How come? Uh, because I was doing it for 25 years. I've done it all, all jobs, all kinds of signings, all kinds of deals. And, and I just felt it was time to move on. 25 years is a long time to be anywhere. So you don't really see that in the music business that much. I'm going to end up with a, a question here about um, vinyls. I know you're a big vinyl buff, just like I am. I've never bought vinyl in my life. I don't know what you're talking about. So. <laughs> Great. Me neither. <laughs> I can see that. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> but uh, wherein lies the magic with the vinyl for you? The vinyl thing, yeah. I mean, we're a strange kind of people, vinyl buyers, aren't we? We're kind of a little bit competitive little bit kind of strange and um if it came down to it if your house was on fire and everybody was in there and you had like all your clothes and everything else what is the first thing that you would rescue <laughs> it would be your records you know? <laughs> so that's why it's kind of a bit screwed up but yeah. um but i love it i i can't i don't know why i can't stop and um i love talking about records with other people i love going to record stores i love i love going to other people's houses and looking at their record collections and and playing records so it's um it's just what i do i don't know i can't explain it i just love it everybody should stop being in a rush they should make a cup of coffee sit down put a record on and the world would be a much better place in my opinion so, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely amen to that uh, thank you so much dan for joining us here as an online guest on band bond well happy yeah. to be here yeah thank Re you very really much. nice talking to you and stay safe my friend yep and you okay take care